I just want to remind you of where we're at here and what's happening. Um, we started out looking at this section where uh, the, the uh, Lord Jesus Christ uh, has been meeting with his men for what we call the Last Supper, and he changed that whole thing into uh, a celebration about him in communion. And we know what that's about because we do it here. And ever since that time to tomorrow morning when he's going to actually be on the cross by 9 o'clock, we have all this literature in John, all this scripture, all this teaching that has been taking place between him and the disciples. We're getting a play-by-play of everything that's happening, and it seems like it's a long time in scripture. But remember, it's just from late at night until early in the morning the next day that we're covering all of this. In fact, John chapter 17, which we'll get to in about three sermons here, including today, John chapter 17 is called the High Priestly Prayer of Jesus Christ. And that whole chapter is going to be given to a prayer that Jesus gives for his followers, and you and I are included in that by the way he prays in that particular place, and that's good news. And then it's not going to be until chapter 18 when we finally get to the events that begin the trials and the cross of Jesus Christ. So we've got a long section in here where Jesus is teaching, and we're right in the middle of that with where we're at today in John 16. I want to just kind of refresh your memory that Jesus is teaching about things that are about to happen. The disciples don't understand it. They don't get it. They don't understand that he's going to be on the cross tomorrow morning. And that's not what they were looking for. And they didn't understand that he was going to have to die and come back. And as Gil so ably uh, introduced this this morning, They're a little bit confused about what's happening. The disciples knew that Jesus was about to leave, and it's going to cause them to to weep and to cry over that situation because they would soon, and they weren't sure exactly how, but they were soon not going to have Jesus Christ with them. They were promised, though, that when they see him again, there would be rejoicing in their hearts because not long after they lost him, they were going to gain him back again, and that didn't make sense. They also knew that it was to their advantage in their ministries for Jesus to go away and to go to the Father. That's their advantage because somebody else was going to come. We know that to be the Spirit of God. He's not going to leave them as orphans, but the Spirit would come. You know what? I don't think they understood who the Spirit was. I don't think they understood what he was going to do or how he could do it and how that would be different than Jesus being present in, in, in the flesh. I'm thinking that that night has been already an emotional roller coaster. They found out that one of their number that they had trusted in is a traitor and somehow is going to turn on Jesus Christ. There's going to be consequences for that. And now Jesus is throwing out some teaching here and they don't get it. What an emotional roller coaster. On the other hand, you and I have never seen Jesus in the flesh. We don't even know what he looks like. I'm convinced that he doesn't look like the pictures I saw growing up in Sunday school where we have this long-haired robed guy that's knocking on this door trying to get in. I don't think he looked like that at all, but I don't know what he looked like. I know that he was Jewish, so technically we would say he was an Oriental individual. We know that, but we don't know what he looked like. In fact, Isaiah 53 said, if you saw him in a crowd, you wouldn't pay any attention because he's just an ordinary guy, and there's nothing about him that would make us think that he is special. But I want to be in his presence. I can't wait to see him. And I don't know about you, but I think about him all of the time. And I wonder what it's going to be like to finally be with him. I don't know what it's going to be like, but I just can't wait until that day. Not a day goes by when I don't think about Jesus all day long, uh, for the most part. I did not mourn or cry when he left the earth because I wasn't there. But I will mourn and cry and enjoy when I see him in his appearing. You and I long to be with him the way the disciples got to be with him every day to see him, to, to touch him, to hear him, and to, you know, to eat with him. You also, you know, they bedded down together in their campsites, and they never were without him. He is the greatest. That's what the disciples taught us. Wow, they said, wait till you meet him. You're not going to believe it. So we can't wait. And because he told, they told us about these great things about Jesus Christ, we trust them, and we really feel like we know him, and they have recommended him to us, and we can't wait to be with him. And I am glad in my position as a believer that when I finally do meet him, once I see him, I will never have to leave his presence again. Now, I don't know how that works, but he's going to be there, and he's not going to leave us, and he's not going to forsake us, 
Do you look forward to that day? Can you hardly wait for that when you can see the Lord Jesus Christ and he's going to hug you and tell you how much he loves you? And, and we know he loves us because he, he just proves it every day. Our lives as believers really do all the time revolve around our relationship to Jesus Christ if we know him. And we are not alone. He gave us the Spirit of God as a pledge and he sealed us with him to the day of redemption. That's a spiritual work that God did when we trusted Jesus Christ. That moment when you asked Jesus to be your Savior, when you repented of your sin, said, Lord, I'm trusting in you for the payment of my sins, supernaturally, the Spirit of God entered into you. And that was your seal to salvation. He circumcised your heart. He would never leave you ever again. And he is empowering you for your ministries, whatever your ministry is. I think about that every day. I can't wait to meet him face to face. I cannot imagine how happy we will be when we finally get to be with him. Can you imagine that? Do you think about that? Are you looking forward to it? I hope you are. Has the reality of actually seeing this stuff happen, of actually being in the presence of God, does it seem so remote that it's never going to happen? Or do you just feel like, you know, this could happen any day and I can't wait to be there? Well, in the meantime, we, like the disciples in, in this uh, text before us, we have to work to properly prepare for his coming. And what we're doing to prepare for his coming is we're telling other people about Jesus. We're doing our very best to live the kind of life that Jesus wants us to live. And we're doing our very best to do the things that he wants us to do so that other people can know him. Well, I want you to go back with me to this uh, historical moment when Jesus is talking about, look, I'm going to be leaving for a little while, then I'm going to be back, and then the Spirit of God is coming. And there's a lot of confusion for them there, and sometimes for us. But let's read verses 16 down through 24. Jesus says, A little while, and you will no longer see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. Some of the disciples then said to one another, now they're whispering, they don't want Jesus to hear this. They're talking about what he just said. You know, when you're in front of your teacher, sometimes it's embarrassing when you have to admit you have no idea what they're talking about. You don't know what's going on. And that was the disciples. He just said, a little while we won't see him, and then a little while we will see him. What is he talking about? They're talking among themselves. We don't want to look foolish. And so they're saying, what is this thing that he is telling us? A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. And because I go to the Father. What is this? So they were saying, what is this that he says a little while? We do not know what he's talking about. They're sitting there waiting for somebody to give an answer and nobody's speaking up because nobody knows. Jesus knew, and we must take this as supernaturally Jesus knew, Jesus knew that they wished to question him. And he said to them, are you deliberating together about this that I said a little while and you will see me? Now, that's exactly what he was doing. They know that's what he's doing. Or they, he knows that's what they were doing because he's the son of God. And the Spirit of God revealed it to him. So he knows what they're talking about. So in verse 20, he says, truly, truly, that means pay attention. I'm raising a flag here. You need to listen to what I'm about to say. Truly, truly, this is the truth. I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. And I think Jesus pulled out of that whole scenario. Here's what you really need to know. After everything that I've said, I want you to know you're headed for a time of joy. Yeah, there's going to be some grief ahead of that, but you're headed for a time of joy. And we need to take that to heart. He says, whenever a woman is in labor and has pain because her hour has come, but when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy that the child has been born into the world. Therefore, you too have grief now, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and no one will take your joy away from you. Now, I want to add verses 23 and 24, because I think Jesus intentionally meant them to be joined to what he just said. Here's the promise. In that day, you will not question me, question me about anything. He's got to be talking about when he's come back, right? He's got to be talking about when he's been gone a little while, now he's back, and he says, when that day comes, you will not ask me any questions anymore. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be made full. 
Now, remember, we just talked about rejoicing in joy in verse 22. Now he talks about how we should pray in our ministries. And in verse 24, he talks about that joy there as well. Those two are obviously connected in the mind of Jesus Christ, and we need to make a connection with them. All right, let's look together at the text and see what he has to teach us and how we can benefit from that. In verses 16 through 23a, that's the first major section of this. We learn that the greatest joy of our believing hearts is to be with Jesus. Now, no one in this room has ever been in his presence to where you could see him and describe to us, here's what Jesus looks like. Uh, That didn't happen for us. It happened for the disciples. We don't know what he looked like. But we can't wait to see him, and we can't wait to be with him. The disciples were with Jesus, and they were happy when they were with him, and they're headed into a time of grief because he said, I'm going to be gone for a while. But they didn't understand that. First, we have to keep in mind that the apostles in this situation uh, have had opportunity to live with Jesus Christ for approximately three years. Everywhere he went, they went. Everything he taught, they heard. They watched him do miracles in in places that, that everywhere they went, there was no place he didn't do miracles unless that place had a lot of unbelief about him, like his hometown. But they know what he's capable of. They know what he can do. And they are with the God of the universe. He is God in the flesh. I think they have a small understanding of that. I don't think they understand at all, but they have a small understanding. This man is the Son of God. In fact, Peter said that in Matthew chapter 16. You're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. I can't imagine what it was like for them to learn where uh, at Jesus' feet where they were often sitting and to be a part of their lives and to give up a part of their lives. Three years right now that they gave up to Jesus Christ. I do not think that they had a clue as to the responsibility that was about to be theirs when Jesus Christ was going to leave permanently. They don't know what they're in for. In verse 16, Jesus is predicting the night of his betrayal, that he would shortly be gone and that they would not see him. Now that's the part that makes them sad. That's the part they're going to weep over. In a little while then, though, they would see him again. And they would have joy at that point. And it's always good to have hope at the end of the day, isn't it? They have, had, they, have had, they have been supernaturally prevented from understanding all these things until after the resurrection. Now, since I messed that up, let me try it again. Until after the resurrection, the Lord God, the Father, has kept them from understanding what Jesus is saying fully. They don't know how this all goes together, and they're, they're, they're going to do this on purpose because God is making them do that. But when there is the resurrection, they're, then they're going to say, oh, I get it. And then, and then in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, when Jesus is leaving, and, and then the Spirit of God comes in Acts chapter 2, then they're going to say, oh, now it's making more sense. And the longer they go, the more sense it makes. And there's reasons for that. We're going to talk about that, especially when we talk about the resurrection of Christ coming up in a few chapters. Supernaturally, they really couldn't understand what was going on. So naturally, they're confused about what he's saying. And you and I have hindsight, and they do too after the cross, but give them some credit. Cut them some slack. If it was you and I that were sitting there listening to this, and we'd been through what they'd been through, we wouldn't understand either. And we wouldn't be getting it. And uh, we would be asking these kinds of questions. In verses 17 and 18, they were trying to understand what he meant. What did Jesus mean? I remember sitting in college classes or even in seminary, and the professor would end the class and walk out of the room, and I can remember turning to other people and saying, did you get what he said over here? Did, did that make any sense to you? What in the world was he talking about? And then we try to discuss and figure out what did the professor mean, You know, because it didn't look good for grown men to run down the hallway at seminary trying to catch the professor before he ducked into his office to say, hey, I don't get it. I don't know what you meant. I had another problem in seminary, and then you know that I'm colorblind, and they had these, um, I don't know, Noel, were they cream or tan-colored chalkboards? And, and if a professor picked up a red marking pen and wrote on that board, it was invisible to me. And I started to panic. I don't know what he's writing. I can't read. I can't even see it. It's just like there's nothing there. So I'd have to ask people after, did, did you get this over here? He said, well, yeah, he wrote that on the board. He said, well, yeah, I can't see it. And so people would help me. 
And that's what the disciples are doing. What is he talking about? Why can't we understand this? And, and it just doesn't make sense. And they're asking each other. And so they want to know. They're sitting around having a group discussion. Is there anybody here in the group that understands what he is talking about? So they started a little discussion group. What on earth is Jesus meaning? How do you explain this little while phrase that he made? Statements uh, that he's going to go to the Father. Now, we've heard that before, but I don't get it. We know the rest of the story. And they didn't at this point, so let's not be too hard on them. Uh, they, they had understanding later, and we only have understanding because we have the full counsel of God in front of us. What we take from this is that Jesus, ahead of the event, and here's what I want you to get. Ahead of the event, I'm talking about his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Before Jesus got to that in life, he was telling them, this is what is going to happen. Now, I want you to know that there are churches all over the world that play with this stuff and say that you can't take the Bible literally, you can't believe what it says, you can't believe that if it says this is going to happen, that it's literally going to happen this way. And I want you to see that that isn't true. Jesus made a very factual statement. In a little while, you won't see me, and you're going to cry about it. In a little while longer, you're going to see me again, and you will rejoice. And what I want us to learn is that what we take from this is that ahead of the event that is taking place, Jesus told them exactly what was going to happen. That they didn't understand it does not change the fact that they were told exactly what what was going to happen. So let me ask you ahead of time, how do you understand the end end times events of the Bible? How do you understand the book of Revelation? How do you understand what's going to happen at the end of the world? Are you one of those who says, well, the Bible isn't literal, it's not going to be fulfilled literally, so all that stuff he wrote, we really don't know what's going to take place. Or do you say, now wait a minute, The pattern of the Bible is it says something, and then as we see it fulfilled, it turns out exactly as the way it was said. It's literal. And I want you to see that here. After the fact, we and the disciples could see that everything Jesus said fit perfectly what was about to happen in their future. They did lose Jesus. They did cry. They did run for cover. They hid out because they were afraid. And they wondered what was going on. And then all of a sudden, this woman comes back to them and says, Hey, uh, myself and this group of other ladies, we just saw the risen Lord. And they're going to say, How can this be? This is impossible. And it all turned out exactly as the scripture predicted. He said this would happen, then this would happen, this would happen, this would happen. And after it was already done, they look back and say, It's exactly what he said. And that's where I want us to be. We are to understand that what is yet to happen in the future that God has already spoken about in the Word of God, we may not understand it uh, perfectly. In fact, our denomination is about to throw up their hands and say, there's so much division on the end times, we're going to stop being premillennial and let all millennialists into the evangelical free church. I, I don't like that. I'm opposed to that. I was opposed to it last time, but they're going to push it till they get that done. I think it is important what you believe about the end times. I don't buy that it's all figurative and and you can't make any sense out of it. I think it says this is what's going to happen. An antichrist is going to come. A tribulation is going to come. A second coming is going to happen. And the kingdom of God on earth will be literal because I'm pre-trib and pre-mill in my theological position. And I'm that way because I have seen over and over in the Bible, way back in the Old Testament, God said this is going to happen. And it happened exactly as he said. He said, this is going to happen, and it happened exactly as he said it. Literally, it was true. And now he just got through telling them, I'm going to leave, you're going to cry, I'm going to come back, you're going to rejoice, then I'm leaving again, I'm going to the Father, but I'm sending the Spirit, and you will have joy in your ministry. And I believe that's exactly what happened. Because the Bible says that's what happened. God predicts things, and I think we need to do what the Bible does with what God predicts, and that is take it literally that it's literally going to happen that way. God is telling us these things, and that's a confidence builder. God never lies. God never makes a mistake. God never made a prediction that didn't happen exactly as he said it would happen. So Jesus was aware supernaturally of their discussion, 
and that they didn't understand it. And I've often wondered what God thinks about theologians sitting around a coffee table in a church or in a seminary discussing what the Bible means, and they don't get it, and it's wrong. And I wonder what Jesus thinks about that, and it happens all the time. Well, it's happening right here with the disciples. They don't get it. They don't understand. So Jesus corrects their theology and this discussion they're having right now. In verse 20, he said, In a little while they will be crying, they will be weeping, they will be mourning. That's what you do when your best friend is killed. But the world is going to rejoice. Then they will have their grief turned into joy. That's a good thing. And one of these days, although I, don't ha- I haven't seen Jesus, someday I get to meet him face to face. And I don't know how I'm going to respond then. I, I don't know if I'm going to jump for joy or fall down on the ground and, and worship at his feet. I don't know, but I'm going to be happy. We grieve because we lose something and we rejoice because we find something dear to our hearts. And it was dear to the heart of the enemies of Jesus Christ to murder him. And I don't want you to miss what the text says. It says, but the world will rejoice while you're weeping. And I want you to understand, it is dear to the heart of those who don't know Jesus Christ, for Jesus Christ to have been killed. What brings the world joy? The death of Jesus Christ. What is the world working for in our society today? The death of Jesus Christ and anything that refers to Jesus Christ. So they've taken the Ten Commandments out of the courthouses, and they're trying to erase, uh, back in Washington, any verses that are on any monuments. We've got to get rid of those, they say. We're trying to erase Jesus Christ. Why? Because they hate Jesus Christ. They rejoice when he loses. There was rejoicing when school became, uh, schools became an illegal place to share the Word of God and to preach the Word of God and to open your Bible as a teacher Uh, like Audrey Gibson used to be able to do, and and read the Psalms with her students as they learned it. Can't do that anymore. People are happy about that. But it was also dear to the heart of the disciples to learn that though the world and Satan murdered Jesus, he will conquer them both, and he will rise from the dead, and that he is the real deal. Now don't pass too quickly by the joy of the world over Jesus' death. Don't think for a minute that the enemy has any, any room in their heart for Jesus. They don't. They have only hatred for Jesus. They never have love or compassion for Jesus. I don't understand how we get away with what we get away with, that we still have free churches in America, that we can still walk out on the street and tell somebody about Jesus Christ. Recently, Um, My dad was at a place in Arkansas, and they were handing out Bibles at a school. They wouldn't let him, of course, uh, into the school there, but they had to stand on the sidewalk. And the secretary called the police and said, we've got people out here handing out Bibles. The police showed up, and to, to the dismay... Of the secretary, the police officer stood and chatted with the, with the Gideons while they had finished handing out their Bibles. And when they were done, he just went home or back to work. Not the way the secretary wanted it to turn out. Maybe God planted a Christian police officer there, and he just made sure they weren't you know, stepping a toe on the grass or something. But it didn't turn out the way they wanted. You know what the Bible teaches? You either love him or you hate him. That's all there is. You either rejoice when he gets his, or you weep over it. In verse 21, Jesus illustrates the path of the disciples by the story of an expectant mother. The mother goes through tribulation and birth, but soon forgets it because it is outweighed by the presence of the child. I remember my friend George and Kathy, I've told other people this at different times, my favorite story. I went to see him after work because his wife, Kathy, was having their first baby. I thought, pretty exciting. I'll go down and lend a little support. I don't know that they're Christians. I want to spend some time with them. I walk in the hall where, where the, the hallway where the women are, you know, back in the back giving birth, and I could hear this lady screaming foul things and nasty things about her husband clear down the hall. I thought, wow, somebody is really getting it down there. Well, it turns out it's my friend George. And I, I said to a nurse, I said, is Kathy having her baby? Yes. Um, you can't go back. I said, okay, but in a break, could you send George out here? And I'm going to pray with him. She goes, George needs to come see you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> so, so she goes and gets George and sends him out there. This guy comes out like a whip, whip pup. He's got his little 
hospital gown on and all the hat and stuff. He comes out. I said, what's the matter? He said, do you hear that? I said, well, I can't help but hear that. And she's angry. Apparently, he never gets to touch her again as long as they live. And uh, I prayed with him, and I put my arm around him and said, you can do it, buddy. He says, I can't go back in there. I said, you can go back in there. I said, you've got to go back in. He said, I can't go. He said, you can. So uh, I kind of pushed him down the hall. He went back in. I think they've had at least three more kids since then. <laughs> and Jesus said, you're about to go through a time of tribulation, and you're going to weep over it. It's going to be painful, extremely painful. But when you see what I have planned, it's going to be full of joy. They will go through tribulation at his death, but seeing him in the resurrection, when Mary Magdalene comes and says, I saw the Lord, I touched him, he's back, the joy would come back. There is often tribulation before glory in a fallen world. We're just going to sneak down to verse 33. These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. What's it say? I have overcome the world. Take courage. The world hates Jesus Christ. Well, here's some bad news. They hate you too if you belong to Jesus Christ. But don't worry about that. We're to love them, to reach them with the gospel of Christ so they can be followers of Christ too. Jesus says, I have overcome. Past uh, perfect. He overcame the world and it remains in a condition of being overcome. Verses 22 to 23, when they they see Jesus again, their hearts will be filled with joy and no one can ever take it away from them. Now in Acts chapter 5, verse 41, they have just been taken in and flogged for preaching that Jesus is the Messiah. This is after the resurrection, right? Acts 5. And it says that they went out rejoicing that they could suffer shame for the name of Jesus. That's a different group than we have right here. Something has changed, and we're going to walk through that change as we go through this and look at that. Something's different with these guys. Now, I told you, and we looked at it. In verse 22, the word joy appears there. He's talking about when he's gone, when he comes back. Then he's talking about their ministries that are to come in verses 23 and 24, and he said, and you're going to have joy there too. And then we see the apostles after Jesus has ascended to heaven, And they just got flogged and told by the leaders, don't you dare preach Jesus anymore. And they walk out rejoicing that they got to suffer for Jesus. Be of courage. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. That's what he said. And that's what they did. My friends, in our battle, know this. There will be pain in serving Jesus, but he has promised that there will be something that is coming. I love this passage in Psalm 30. I'm sure you do too. David is speaking. He says this, Psalm 30, verse 5, For his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may last for the night, but a shout of joy comes in the morning. shout of joy comes in the morning. Tomorrow morning, these guys are going to be weeping. In just a couple days, they will be rejoicing. That's what God promised. Finally, in verses 23 and 24, that division here, Jesus is going to be talking here about the future. And we learn that for the sake of the ministry of Christ, we will make our request to the Father in the name of Jesus our Lord. See, Jesus has a plan. He came to fulfill what the Father required for righteousness, for the forgiveness of sins. His plan is not to spend the rest of time on earth, not right now. His plan is to go back to heaven, send the Spirit of God, and let you and I do the ministry with the help of God. And he knows where he's going. The disciples don't understand it, but he knows where he's going, and that's what this is about. They're going to remember Jesus said this. Now they, they are instructed to make their request for ministry, which is what they're headed for, which they didn't understand at all. They didn't realize God was going to use them to change their world. Same thing God wants to do with us. Sad news is they were closer to reaching their world in their day than we are to reaching ours. In fact, in America, we're losing ground. But they're instructed. When you pray in the future, you pray in my name, Jesus says. Let's not forget what it means to ask in the name of Jesus. 
We ask in the name of Jesus because we are asking for things congruous with Jesus' character and ministry. You ask my Father anything in my name. Well, what am I going to ask the Father? I'm not going to ask Him for sinful things. I'm not going to ask Him for things that don't promote the gospel. I'm not going to ask Him for things that I can just, you know, uh, enjoy that pleasure of that lustful thing, my new boat or whatever, uh, on myself. That's not what He said. He's talking about people that are engaged in ministry. They need help in their ministry. Jesus says, in that, in my name, you ask whatever you want, I'll give it to you. If I ask in his name, it should be something Jesus would want. It should be according to his will. You guys know a a Christian counselor by the name of Larry Crabb? Larry writes this. When I was 10 years old, I first heard Matthew 21, 22, where Jesus, who never lies, said, if you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Now, this is in the heart of a 10-year-old boy. And it says there, whatever. And so he said, I believed in the whatever model of prayer. Ask for whatever you want, and it's yours. And he says, I remember running outside and standing in the middle of our family's driveway, and I said, Jesus, I'm asking you right now, I'm praying that I could fly like Superman. (laughs) And he said, and I know you can do that. I have faith that you can. So he said, Lord, I'm going to jump, and you do your thing. And he said, I jumped into the air, and a half a second later, I landed a half a foot down the driveway, and I'm still on the ground. And he said, I did it three more times, and I never flew. Each time, I landed back on the driveway, further down the driveway. He said, I had believed, and I had asked, just like Jesus said, but I did not receive. And then listen to what he says at the end of this. Thus began my 50-year journey of confusion about prayer. That's a long time to be confused. Friends, prayer is not a lucky rabbit's foot uh, to get things according to your own name. Let me say it this way. When you're on a mission, you pray for things that will aid you in the mission. You don't pray for other things. If you know Christ is your Savior, you're here today, you're on a mission. What else would you pray for but for the success of your mission? And ask for things that will help you succeed in that mission. Prayer in Jesus' name is the path to joy in life. Life is about making yours count for eternity. So I want to remind you to ask big A man by the name of Fred said this, I grew up in Newfoundland, Canada in 1972. Our seventh grade French class was going to take a special weekend trip to the French islands just off the southern coast. The entire weekend was going to cost students $50. A large sum of money, I thought. I really want to experience the French culture. I thought it would do wonders to help me in my studies of the French language. But I assumed my parents could not afford it, so rather than put my parents in an awkward position of saying no, I decided I wouldn't ask. Imagine my surprise a couple of years later when my sister arrived home from school and announced her class was taking a 14-day Mediterranean cruise. The trip was not going to cost 50 bucks, it was going to cost 1000 And she blurted out, Mom, can I go? He thought, what audacity for her to put Mom and Dad in that position. Much to my surprise, my mom and dad declared, well, we don't know where we're going to get that kind of money, but sure, you can go. We'll find a way to get it. (laughs) Well, this has taught me something about prayer. Do I sometimes fail to ask God for what is on my heart? Now, remember, this is in the context of asking for the things we should ask for. Do I think his resources are scarce? Does my failure to ask indicate that my faith is small or that I assume God is unwilling to give me what is good. My sister and my parents taught me more about prayer in that one episode than I ever learned in the rest of my life. So we ask big for our ministries. And then we have to have faith. We have to have faith. How many of you have heard of a famous pastor in Los Angeles by the name of E.V. Hill? You know who I'm talking about? Some people call him Ed. E.V. Hill, famous, famous man of God. Well, He pastored the Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church in Los Angeles for many years. 
And he tells this story of how mama's love and prayers changed his life. Now listen closely. During the height of the Depression, Hill's real mother, who also had five children of her own, no dad bringing in any money, realized one day, I don't have enough money to feed the kids. So she uh, sent her four-year-old Ed, E.V. Hill, to live with a friend in a very small country town, and the name of that town was Sweet Home. Ed just called her Mama, this new lady, this friend. That's Mama. And as he was growing up in Sweet Home, Mama displayed remarkable faith, which led her to have big plans for young Ed, not even her real son. Against nearly insurmountable obstacles, Mama helped Ed graduate from their little high school, the little country school, the only graduate that year, and then she insisted that Ed go to college. She took Ed to the bus station, handed him a ticket and five dollars, and said, now go off to Prairie View College, and then she added, and Mama is going to be praying for you. Hill claims that he didn't know much about prayer, but he knew Mama knew about prayer. When he arrived at the college with a dollar and 90 cents left in his pocket, they told him he needed $80 in cash in order to register. And here's what he describes as what happened. He said, I knew I only had a dollar 90 in my pocket. I got in line. And the devil said to me, get out of line. But I heard my mama saying in my ear, I'll be praying for you. So I stood in line on Mama's prayer. Soon there was another student, the last one between him and the table, and uh, that student started to do their, their registration and pay. And he says, I began to get pretty nervous, but I stayed in line. Just about that time, the other student got all her stuff and turned away. A man by the name of Dr. Drew touched me on the shoulder, and he said, are you Ed Hill? And he said, yes. Are you the Ed Hill from Sweet Home? He said, yes. Have you paid yet? Well, not quite. He's right here at the table. He said, well, I've been looking for you all morning. He said, well, what do you want with me? And he said, well, we have here a four-year scholarship that will pay your room and your board and your tuition and give you $30 a week to spend, I'm sorry, a month to spend. And I heard Mama say, I will be praying for you. This is because I think he is a man of God, and God wanted him to be a preacher, and it was in the will of God. And so God answered Mama's prayers. And that's what I want you to get. Number one, as we close, we can't wait for Jesus' return. Now, by that I mean I just can't wait. You can't either. But we're going to have to be like Paul and wait like Paul waited. Let me just... Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and tell you Paul's situation on that. And it says this, Therefore, always being of good courage and knowing that while we're at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord, and that's our situation here. For we, uh, I'm sorry, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Yes, I want to be with Jesus, but I'm willing to do the ministry until I get there. Secondly, our greatest joy in loving Jesus, is yet to come when we will be with him. And that day's coming. I hope you're looking forward to it. And finally, to remember to pray in his name, pray in his will, pray about his mission that he gave you and the mission of others, about his desires, and in his character, that which is within the character of God, And then you will know what he means when he says, and whatever you ask, the Father will give you. Because we're asking in Jesus' name, for Jesus, and he is our Savior. Let's pray together, shall we?
Gracious Heavenly Father, I just ask that you would help us not to, not to listen to something like what happened to Pastor Hill and say, well, that's never happened to me. I'm still paying off my school, or I had to do my own tuition, and I asked you for help. Help us to understand, Lord, that this promise for us is about the things that are in the will of God, and you don't always respond like you did to Pastor Hill, but you see us through, and you teach us things along the way. But you did say, ask for whatever we want in in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for our, our work of service to him, and you'll give it. Maybe we don't ask very big. Maybe we don't ask enough. Maybe we aren't believing that you will do what you say. Larry Crabb remained earthbound because it had nothing to do with your will or your ministry. So he went outside and hopped down the driveway four times, and then he had problems with prayer. Help us to understand so we don't have problems with prayer. But help us to go forward with faith. Because Jesus is on our side. And he is praying for us. He is an advocate with the Father. He makes intercession for us night and day. And we thank you that we have been called to serve you. Help us to serve and complete our missions by faith, through the Spirit, and with joy. And I ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.